just going to be talking about what is a virus and what are diseases in general. So the first thing, um, our guest presenters are really going to be talking about coronavirus specifically. Again, can everyone mute themselves just from here on out? If you have questions, feel free to ask, but it's just because we want to try to get through the material before our guest speakers are here. So just to kind of give you a good understanding of the coronavirus, we really want to talk about diseases first. So the first thing that we wanted to talk about is what causes a disease. Um, we're not sure if um, any of you have heard this specific term, but basically something that causes a, a disease is considered a pathogen. Just like give us a thumbs up if you've heard that word before in your science class. Yeah, a pathogen is basically like a bacteria, a virus, a fungi, something that enters your body and kind of creates some sort of disease or disorder. It causes you to be sick. So one thing that we're really going to be focusing on is because SARS-CoV-2 or the thing that's causing COVID-19, the pathogen, it's a virus. So we really want to be talking about viruses specifically. So I'm going to share my screen and show everyone sort of a picture of a virus, just so we can kind of understand what we're studying. Wait, uh, COVID-19 is, uh, is a mutation of SARS, right? Um. So basically, these coronaviruses, um, there have been many coronaviruses before this. SARS-CoV-2 is not the first coronavirus, but it does have a deadly mutation that makes it even more dangerous than other coronaviruses. So that's a good, important thing to keep up. So can everyone see this image? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So on the left, what we can see is that we have just a general diagram of what kind of a virus looks like. We have an outer covering and inside the virus, we have some genetic information. And this genetic information can be DNA, RNA, it doesn't really matter. The main thing we want you to take away from this is just that there is some sort of like the brain of the virus. And that's the genetic information that controls the virus's actions. And this brain or genetic information is then covered sort of by this capsid. And that's important because you can kind of think of it as like the capsid being the skull that surrounds your brain, if that makes sense. So this is just like a general idea of what a virus looks like. On the right, we have an image of SARS-CoV-2. And the coronavirus, so corona in Latin actually means crown. So based on the image that we're seeing here, why do people think that the coronavirus is called the crown virus? Does it affect the brain? It doesn't. That's a really good guess. But actually, um, you can do. Does everyone see these like little red spikes kind of coming out of the virus? Yeah. Yeah. So these are considered spiky glycoproteins, but they're basically spikes that are supposed to look kind of like the spikes of a crown. So that's kind of why we say corona, if that makes sense. But that just kind of gives you a better idea of like the structure of the virus and what exactly is doing the infection within your cell. Yeah, so as Isha mentioned, there's a lot of different types of pathogens. I know some people were talking in the chat about bacteria, fungi, parasites, and obviously viruses, but there's something unique about viruses that makes something a virus. And that is that first of all, a virus cannot survive outside of an another living organism. So in order to function properly, in order to reproduce, a virus needs to be within another living organism. And the yes. way they do that is really cool. So we're about to show you this diagram of how a virus actually takes over a cell. Yeah. So can everyone see this? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So the orange blob right here is the cell, and the smaller thing with purple dots around it is the virus. And we can see here that the virus is able to get into the cell. And in step two, we see that the virus releases the genetic material, which, like we mentioned earlier, is like the brain of the virus. And this is a really cool part. So that little red strand now can basically take over the cell and tell the cell to make nutrients and resources that the virus needs. So you can see that in the third phase over here, there's now more of these 
white hexagons, there's more of these purple dots, and there's more genetic material. And those are all things that the cell needs to make more copies of itself. And then finally, when the virus realizes that it's used up all the cell's resources, then the cell will basically explode and release many, many more viruses. So you can see how one virus can become dozens of viruses just by taking over one cell. And I think a really cool analogy to think of this is, let's pretend you're a spy. And this is, you're in a war, you're a spy for the United States, and right now Russia is building weapons that they're going to be using against the United States. In this scenario, you're going to be the virus, so you jump into the factory, and right now all the robots in the factory are making weapons, they're making missiles, they're making guns, but you reprogram the machines and the robots to make ice cream instead. And now you can eat the ice cream and become stronger. You can give the ice cream to all your spy friends and to all your American allies. And then you, when the factory is no longer useful, you take down the factory and escape with all the ice cream. So that's basically how a virus works. It just goes into this place that is already really specialized at making stuff. And then it makes that place make things useful for them. Yeah. Yeah. So then just out of curiosity, now that we sort of understand a virus, and again, it's okay if you don't get all of these concepts, we're just trying to explain it to you so that when our professionals come in, when they say things like virus or immune system, you kind of have already a background of what they mean. So just out of curiosity, um, does anybody know types of diseases that are caused by viruses? Like, can anyone name any? Uh, wait, viruses, right? Oh, yeah. Or like a disease caused by a virus, sure. Uh, SARS, Spanish flu. Yes, exactly. Uh, M, uh, uh, I think it was like M E R or something. MERS. Yes, the MERS virus. Ebola. And then, Ebola. Yes, the Ebola virus. Uh, uh, what what is that thing called? The a bird, the bird flu. Yes, avian flu. And then, um, yeah. Okay, those are a great number of examples. I'm actually really impressed that people knew that many. Um, so now that we sort of understand kind of like what a virus looks like, because viruses are pretty dangerous, I mean, they infiltrate your cells and they basically make your cell a weapon against you, right? They make your cell create even more viruses. So what protects our body from these viruses in the first place? Like if they're around everywhere, why aren't we just dying? Um, so we have a really important part of our body known as the immune system. And the immune system is really, really key in trying to protect us from these viruses and these pathogens. So our immune system has two specific, it has two different parts. Um, I'm gonna be talking about first the non-specific defense. So it's basically just a part of our immune system that prevents any sort of pathogen from invading. So you can kind of think as, the non-specific defense is a type of defense that basically, it doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't really target a specific pathogen or a specific virus. It just try to, tries to keep everything outside of your body. So this is kind of an unrelated, but will become related um, question. Does anyone know what the largest organ is? I know this. Uh... Isn't it the skin? Lungs? Yes, great. The skin is the largest organ, and the skin is actually one of the biggest parts of our non-specific um, line of defense because you can kind of think of it. It prevents viruses from trying to enter your body because the skin just protects any sort of entry, and we think that's super important. It doesn't. Your skin doesn't know whether or not the thing that's trying to enter is a good guy or a bad guy. Um, it doesn't know if it's a good bacteria or a bad virus or a bad bacteria, but it just tries to protect every your body from all of the ears. Other parts of our non-specific line of defense include um, our earwax, our like nose hairs. I know that sounds really, really gross, but they're actually super important because they can prevent different invaders and different pathogens from entering your body. So for example, sometimes when you sneeze, that's a great way of your body trying to kind of rid yourself from these pathogens. Yeah. So uh, does anyone have any questions about nonspecific 
defense before we head on? Yeah, is someone raising their hand or no? No questions? Okay, so let's say a virus is able to get through your skin or a virus is able to not get trapped in earwax. What happens then? So your body- Like what if you had a cut? Yeah, so your body has a second line of defense called specific defense. And these, the main players in this defense scheme are white blood cells. And white blood cells don't just randomly attack everything. If they did, we would not be alive right now. But white blood cells know exactly what a pathogen looks like and how to destroy it. So there's many, many different types of white blood cells, and they have many different ways of destroying a pathogen. So over here, I know these are Pokemons, I think. I think these are Pokemons, but let's pretend these purple things are bacteria or viruses or a parasite. Some white blood cells are able to release these really sticky proteins that are these blue things over here called antibodies. And these sticky proteins can basically attach themselves onto a pathogen and keep the pathogen from moving around. So also if another white blood cell sees a pathogen with these sticky blue things on it, then it knows I have to kill that because that's a pathogen. Um, another way that a white blood cell can stop an infection is down here where these orange blobs are. Basically, if a white blood cell sees another cell already has been infected by a virus or a bacteria, it can kill that infected cell. And now that we know how viruses work, that can obviously be very useful, right? Because if one virus gets into a cell, if we're able to kill that cell before the virus completely takes over, then we don't have hundreds of viruses coming out of that cell later down the road. So white blood cells are really, really important to keeping infections under control. Does anyone have any questions about white blood cells? They're super, super cool. And there's a oh. lot to cover about them. What are the uh, white blood cells called when they like, when they find an infected cell and gobble them up? What are they like called? So those They're white blood cells, oh. Uh, so no, those ahead. white blood cells are called macrophages. So we didn't show that in the slide there, but some white blood cells are much, much larger than the typical cell. And they'll basically just eat up infected cells or they'll eat up a pathogen. And we call those macrophages. And as Eric mentioned, um, neutrophils also do that too. So we're not going to jump into like the nitty gritty of the immune system today, but just know that white blood cells have so many different types of functions and yeah. Yeah, white blood cells are very, very important in just kind of getting rid of these pathogens. So you can kind of think of it in the way that your non-specific line of defense is just trying to prevent these pathogens from even, even entering your body or when they do enter, they just try to get rid of them really quickly. But your specific lines of defenses try to target specifically which cells are infected. Um, where exactly are these viruses and then try to get rid of them. So before we kind of go into an example that hopefully should explain the concept in a more kind of bigger picture way, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I have a question. You know, yeah. when like a phagocyte got like eats or whatever the virus, right? What does like the phagos like what does it do inside to the virus? Does it like crush it or like yeah, that's a really good question. So what happens is that when these phagocytes or things like macrophages are able to kind of just take the virus, they're able to basically just use things like lysosomes and just these little things that will then break down the virus into little particles that then are not able to be used anymore and they can't spread to other cells. Again, these are some really great questions that everyone's is, everyone is asking, but if you are a little confused by, you know, what these words mean, don't worry, you don't need to know these words to understand the big questions. So with that, we're just going to show um, kind of a diagram that will just basically explain kind of the non-specific and specific line of defenses. One second. Okay. 
And we actually have Dr. Maldonado. Um, she just joined us, so she'll be able to speak with us in a little bit just about like her experiences and her understanding. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly to go through kind of a simulation and just sort of test the concept that we just taught you all. So for everyone looking at this, imagine you are in a castle and you can see that this castle has, you know, a moat. And everyone knows what a moat is, right? It's like something that you bring down that lets people cross the water. But sometimes when a castle is under attack, it tries to bring up the moat so no one can cross the ocean or cross, not the ocean, but like the water separating it. So let's say that um, we have a thief that's trying to sort of enter this castle. And what happens is that the thief, some of the thieves, like the moat is drawn up and some of the thieves aren't able to swim, but only one of them is able to get into the castle. And we see that we have these knights that are inside the castle. We see that a lot of the knights are able to recognize the thief's face and put up a lot of wanted posters to like alert the other knights that, hey, there is a specific thief that's trying to take over the castle and we need to save the castle before it gets ruined. So these knights are then able to put up wanted posters to catch them. So kind of in this analogy, what would we consider the thief? Let's start with that. Like, what would the thief be in our immune system? A pathogen. Exactly. The thief would be the pathogen or the virus. Then what would we consider the moat for the castle? The skin. Yeah, we would consider it the skin or in general, kind of that non-specific line of defense, because oh. let's say there's even a, like a good messenger that's trying to bring in news, but when the moat is drawn up, it prevents good and bad guys from entering the castle. So the non-specific line of defense, you're right, it is the skin, but like in a bigger picture, it's also just a non-specific line of defense. So this should be super easy then. For inside the castle, what would we consider these knights? White blood cells. White blood cells. Exactly. We consider them white blood cells and we consider them to be part of our specific line of defense. So does anybody have any questions based off of sort of that analogy? We just wanted to explain the concept in bigger pictures. Uh, I have a question. Sure. In that analogy, what would like psycho teams be? Psychoteens, or do you mean cytokines? Yeah, cytokines. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah. Well, I think we, I can message you in the chat just because I want to be able to have um, our professors kind of just explain, but that's a really good question, and I'll message it in the chat to everyone. But um, we just wanted to introduce Dr. Maldonado, as well as Dr. Medirada, I'm not sure if he's on the call just yet, but they're amazing professors who are doing amazing work and they're on the front lines of this pandemic. So can everyone just welcome them and we're really excited to hear from them. So yeah, if everyone can also mute themselves, that would be great. Hi. Hi there. Hello. Um, do you want me to go ahead and get started? Sure, that would be great. Okay, great. So um, I'm Dr. Maldonado. I'm a pediatrician uh, at Stanford University. And does anybody know, can you type in the chat box, I guess, what you think a pediatrician is? Yep, a kid doctor, that's right, I take care of children. So I'm a pediatrician, um, but I'm also a doctor that um, takes care, I, I take care of children uh, specifically who have infections or um, may have infections. So we're called infectious disease doctors. And I also uh, work in an area called epidemiology. So I do all three. Now, um, what do you guys think uh, causes infections? What kinds of things might cause infections? You could type them in the chat box. Yep, protozoa, uh-huh. What other things, viruses? There's two other big ones, bacteria, and then one more. Perfect, wow, you guys are really good. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to teach you anything today. All right, does anybody, flu is good, flu is a virus. So, um, 
Uh, tell me, does anybody know what an epidemiologist is? Person who works with, uh, uh, M, what do you call it? Epidemics, I think. Yeah, epidemics, uh-huh, right. Um, what about, uh, do we do anything besides epidemics? What other kinds of things might we do as epidemiologists? Immunology. Yeah, we can do that too sometimes. So one of the things, so you're right, ep epidemiologists deal with outbreaks, but one of the things that we have to learn first is, is it really an outbreak or did we just not know it was there all the time? So what we try to do is understand what are diseases in populations. So looking at people that are sick or healthy all the time, like looking at across not just you know, maybe in your classroom or maybe in your school or maybe in a whole city or maybe in a state or a country or the world. So we can actually say, all right, we know that uh, there are 130 million people that are born every year and we know that about 60 million people die every year. And what do those 60 million people die of? Well, we can do big studies and figure out that so many people die 30% of people die of infections every year. Uh, about 60% of people die of chronic diseases. And another 10% die of accidents or something like that. So that's question. what an epidemiologist does. Where, where do you get all the uh, data from? Well, that's our job. That's how we, that's the hard part is to find the, the data and to figure out, you know, if it's there or if it's not, how do you ca calculate it? So our job is to get data, is to find data about people, about animals, about anything, and try to understand what the data show us in the big picture so then we can focus in on specific things, okay? So we don't, we find data, but then we use the data to try to understand how to treat diseases. So I'm gonna to talk today about COVID. Um, oh, is it possible to let me share my screen? Yeah, I think Isha can give you screen sharing privileges. Okay, okay perfect, there we go. Oh, wait, nope. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, here we go. Let's see if I can find the, here it is. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, COVID and uh, what a little bit about what we've learned about COVID um, based on the you know, work I've done around epidemiology. Now, if you think about it, did we know anything about, did, who, first of all, what is COVID? Does anybody know what COVID is? COVID-19? Coronavirus 2019. Yes. Uh -huh. Is it an infection? Uh, a it's a virus. Okay, good. So we did not know anything about COVID-19 before December. And so we're learning about it. So there are people who are exploring the immunology. There are people that are exploring the virus itself. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist, so my job is to understand the disease patterns and try to understand if that, the, understanding the disease patterns can help us treat the disease. And so that's one of the things that I try to do. And this is a picture here of a coronavirus. And so you can see um, the red spots and the gray spots. Um, the, so the gray, red spots that you see here are called spike proteins. And these are the proteins that the coronaviruses use to stick to human cells. And where they like to stick, they like to stick on the human cells in the nose in the throat, in the lungs, in the heart, and in the liver and kidney. So those are the main places, although they go to other places as well. And we know that there are other coronaviruses, um, that there's actually seven human coronaviruses. Uh, four of them are, have been around for a long time and they cause colds in people. So they, you get a cold and you get sick, but that's pretty much it. And then there are two other viruses that are brand new that are also coronaviruses. And they uh, caused a disease that was pretty severe. One of them, one 
coronavirus is called SARS, S-A-R-S. That virus disappeared. We think maybe it just mutated and, and didn't couldn't infect people anymore, but we're not sure. And the other one is called MERS, and it stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And that virus is still around, but it doesn't cause as much disease. Now, this virus showed up in uh, around November or December in China, and then over the course of time, it spread all over the world. So, so what is a coronavirus? Well, a coronavirus is a family of viruses. There are many, many coronaviruses. Um, there are coronaviruses in people, there are coronaviruses in animals, like chickens, there's coronaviruses in mice, um, dog coronaviruses, cat. So, but mostly coronaviruses stick to the kind of animal that they're usually infect. So for example, mouse coronaviruses won't infect people and people coronaviruses won't infect mice. Um, now this coronavirus uh, was a virus that we think came from a bat. And what do you think may have happened to, to that coronavirus to make it uh, a human coronavirus? It jumped species. Okay, how, did, how do you think it did that? Mutation. Yep, so it mutated. Now, um, why we think, so we think that this is a new coronavirus and it's COVID-19 stands for coronavirus disease uh, 2019, because it first started in 2020. It's a brand new virus. We're learning a lot more about it still. And we think that it lived in bats and normally bats don't st like to be around people. They like to hide and then they come out at night and they eat insects mostly. Um, but we saw, it, we're seeing a lot more crowding in the world and bats and other animals that are normally wild and never get near humans are now closer to humans. So we think that this bat virus may have mutated to infect maybe other animals that people eat. And then that animal may have been in an animal market and uh, in a place called Wuhan, China. And then the virus mutated some more and it, got, it infected humans. And we know that this mutation occurred in, uh, let me go back, in this spike protein right here, this red triangle. If you see it from the side, it doesn't look like a triangle, but from the top it does. It turns out that the mutation probably happened somewhere in here. And what do you think that mutation might, could have done? It could have made it like uh, able to like connect on to like a blood cell. Yeah, so exactly. It actually, the mutation they think happened sometime in the end of 2019 from the bat. And it made a mutation somewhere in one of the um, RNA um, nucleotides in, in this spike, the gene for the spike protein. And that made it, a, that allowed it to con attach to cells in the lungs and cells in the nose and the throat. And that probably happened somewhere around October or November. That virus now can infect humans. And that receptor, we call it a receptor. A receptor is a place where the virus can stick. And this particular spike protein now sticks to a human receptor called ACE2, A-C-E-2. It stands for, it's a long name. It stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Now, unfortunately, all the other enteroviruses did not, I mean, coronaviruses don't stick to ACE2, they stick to other receptors that don't seem to cause very severe problems. But this virus sticks to ACE2 and it does something to ACE2 that we don't understand yet, but that because of it sticking to ACE2, that seems to make people sicker than the other coronaviruses. Most of the other coronaviruses, the uh, four of the original ones um, make people uh, get sick with a regular cold uh, uh, cold, but this disease is a little bit different. So we'll talk about that. So this virus has made about 10 million people in the world sick so far. 
Does anybody know how many people there are in the world right now, more or less? Uh, 7.2 billion. Yeah. So 10 million is not everybody, but it's still a lot of people. And we're working very hard to try to understand why this virus sticks there, uh, what it does once it sticks there, and also then what, uh, what we can do to keep it from either sticking to that receptor or from making people sick or both. Okay, does, let's see, um, are there any questions? Let me see. Any questions so far? So that's what a coronavirus is, and COVID-19 is one of seven coronaviruses that affect people. All right, so um, we uh, really didn't know much about this coronavirus, and here's another picture of it. You can see it better now. You see the little spike proteins all the way around here, and we think this is really gonna be important, these red spots, because that's how the virus sticks and we know that if people make immunity to those red spots, that they can be, um, the infection can, uh, you can prevent the coronavirus from sticking to people, people cells, okay? So um, we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about what happens when people get sick with COVID-19. So first of all, it can do different things in different people. So for a, if we had, let's just say we had 100 people who had infection with COVID-19, okay? Out of those 19 people, about 30 people or 30% would probably never have symptoms at all. They wouldn't even know they were sick. And then about another 50 people or 50% would have very mild symptoms. So for most of those people, it would be like having the flu, kind of. So um, most people who get COVID who have symptoms, so those 50%, they can get a fever, a cough. They might have a hard time taking a deep breath. But like I said, most people don't get very sick or they don't even have any symptoms. Now, about 20% or 20 people out of 100 who have COVID will either have be sick enough with the symptoms I just mentioned, fever or cough or having a hard time breathing, that they might have to go to the hospital. And out of those 20%, about 5% get really sick and usually need oxygen or might need to be on a ventilator. Does anybody know what a ventilator is? Yeah. Something that helps you breathe. Like the device that um, helps you breathe. It's a breathing machine. It's a machine that has a tube uh, that it connects to a tube, and that tube can be put into your into your lungs, and then you connect. You tape that tube onto your face, and then you connect the um, rest of the tube to this machine. And the machine is about the size of a chair, for example, and you um, plug it in, and that machine can give you oxygen and it can help you breathe also. So it can help give you air, air pressure so it expands your lungs and you can uh, use the oxygen. So it helps you breathe and it helps give you oxygen. So about 5% of people who get infected could have that. Now, most of those people are older people, people older than say 70 years old. Those are the people who get sicker. And then sometimes people who are older and also have other symptoms like diabetes or high blood pressure, but really it's mostly uh, older people that have those conditions that will get sick like that. So, um, but not everybody who has a fever, or cough or shortness of breath, hard time breathing have COVID, they could have other things. Sometimes people can just have a regular old cold virus that can make people sick. So um, any questions about that? Okay, let me go through one more slide here. So how do you stay healthy? How can we keep ourselves from getting COVID? Right now we know that COVID is, it's the way you can protect yourself is by knowing how the virus spreads from person to person or how it spreads in the environment. 
And what we know right now is that the virus is spread from droplets, mostly that come from your mouth and your nose. And believe it or not, when we talk or sing or just breathe sometimes, we have droplets that come out of our mouths. And sometimes they're small droplets, so you don't notice them. But we know that the main way that people get infected with COVID is by getting droplets on their face, on their nose and mouth from people who are infected and have droplets with COVID on them in their nose and mouth. So um, what do you think uh, the main thing to do would be to help you not get infected? Social distancing. Okay, good. And what does that mean, social distancing? Staying away from other people. Okay, and why do you think that would help? Staying at least six feet away from people. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you wash your hands every time you touch something. Right, so here you have what washing your hands, you use soap, scrubbing, rinsing, and drying. Here's social distancing. You try to stay six feet away. What do you think all these things help you do to keep you from getting infected? What does it prevent? The spread um, the getting the droplets. Virus. Right. It prevents spreading droplets. So the real, the most important thing people can do to keep from getting infected with COVID. And oh, by the way, I should say that COVID is the name of the disease and it's caused by a virus. And the virus is not called COVID-19. The disease is called COVID-19. The virus is called SARS-CoV-2. It's a little complicated. SARS-CoV-2 stands for se uh, s sudden, severe, um, acute respiratory syndrome. And then dash, CoV stands for coronavirus, and then two, because we had SARS, CoV-1, which was in 2002 and 2004, and it was a very similar infection. There were some major differences, but that was a SARS virus from, from over um, 18 years ago. Now, SARS-CoV-2 co causes COVID, but the main thing that you can do, the main way that people get infected is by having those droplets uh, come from the mouth or nose of, the, of a person who's infected and land on your mouth or nose or land on your hands and then you get it in your face. Or sometimes um, they can land on tables or chairs or surfaces and you might touch that place and get the virus in your mouth and nose. So that's why washing your hands is important because it keeps your hands clean, keeps you from putting the virus on your face or your nose or your mouth. The social distancing keeps you from being near somebody who might be spreading the droplets, right? And then finally, wearing the mask keeps, actually the wearing the mask doesn't help really as much in keeping you from uh, getting the droplets on you. It actually helps if the person who's infected wears the mask because it keeps them from having their droplets spray out. Now, why do you think wearing a mask yourself might not keep you from getting infected with droplets? Um, because the person actually with the virus is the one spreading the droplets. So if you wear a mask, then the person with the virus can still spread it on other parts of your skin. But if the person infected is wearing a mask, then the droplets can't um, uh, exit the mouth. Right, exactly. And there's another thing that we think happens, although we're not 100% sure, but it, we think this is true, is that when people breathe out, if they're breathing enough, of the virus of the droplets onto somebody else and you're wearing a mask your mask can get damp from the droplets and over time that dampness uh, can seep inside the mask and so can the virus so eventually the virus can touch the front of your mask and over a few minutes to an hour or so that virus can get inside the mask and can still touch your face 
So it is helpful to wear a mask, but we think it's more helpful for people to wear a mask so they can prevent other people from getting infected. So those are the main real points I wanted to talk about, um, about this virus. Um, that's really the main point we need to know. So when people go back to school or go back to camp, these are the main things you can do to keep yourself healthy. Wash your hands so you can, and what do you think that washing your hands does? The soap, the soap uh, that you put, right? So then the virus is like outer layer, the envelope, right? It's made out of like fats and yeah. stuff. So then uh, the soap will like, it like kills fats, I guess. And, and then like, uh, it's up your hands, make sure that your hands are clean. Yeah, the, that's right. So you're all correct. So what happens is the virus has something called lipids on the surface. You, could, you can't really see them in this picture, but there's fat or lipids covering the virus. It's inside a little lipid or fat covering. And then what happens is when you put wash your hands with soap, it takes that fat covering off. And that makes the virus unstable and it falls apart. So it kills the virus. And disinfectant does the same thing. So when you wash your hands, if you have virus on your hands, it's killing the virus. It's making it fall apart so it can't infect you. When you're standing six feet apart or more from people like this, you, that person might be spreading droplets, but you're far enough away most of the time that you won't get those droplets. If you cough or sneeze, you should try to cough or sneeze into a tissue or into your sleeve if you have one, and then make sure you throw away the tissue or wash your hands afterwards. And then wearing the mask is very important as we talked about. So I think I should stop there because I think um, Dr. Madrata wanted to talk as well, right? That'd be great. Yep, okay. Well, thank you so much for listening, and I'll, I'll hand it off now. Thank you so much. Hi, guys. My name is Rishi Madarada. I'm a pediatrician at Stanford, one of Dr. Maldonado's colleagues. And um, I wanted to have a discussion with you um, talking about, really, how does coronavirus affect kids? And then um, thinking about, really, from the hospital perspective, what happens in the hospital. Um, so what do you guys think? Um, uh, how does coronavirus or COVID-19 affect kids? What do you guys think? Um, I think it affects kids because, well, people can't go outside and, like, kids can't go outside and play with their friends mm -hmm. like they usually do. Mm -hmm. Or, like, they can't go to classes they like, like, like outdoor activities. No school. Yeah, yeah. It must have been really tough for all of you guys. Um, in the spring to kind of uh, shift to kind of online class. And so, um, so that has been really challenging. What else? What about to actually kids and getting uh, kids sick with, with coronavirus? Have you guys heard about anything? Uh, I haven't heard about anything, but to very young kids, it's apparently pretty <laughs> severe. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, you know, what's, what's really interesting about, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 causing the illness of COVID-19 is that there's a lot of new information that we are learning, that scientists are learning, that clinicians uh, are learning about to get more information to understand more about it. So one thing that we're seeing, at, at least in kids, is that, uh, two things rather, um, kids are not getting as sick than adults from COVID-19. And the kids who do get sick are less sick than adults. And, um, and one of the things that we're seeing, which is very, very rare, is that um, you know, a very, very small number of kids get this kind of delayed um, inflammation associated with uh, coronavirus, is that their body tries to um, uh, bring lots of cells to fight off an infection, and, and it causes a lot of inflammation, and that inflammation um, affects many parts of the body. So it's very, very, most of the time, um, you know, uh, like if, if anyone has, has had a, a cold, you kind of get mild symptoms like Dr. Maldonado was saying, kind of some yeah. fe fever, not feeling very well, um, uh, in a very ma uh, minority of cases. But what you may be hearing about in the news is, is something called 
uh, pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome or multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And I think we're really learning more about this. So that's one of the things I wanted to um, kind of highlight. Um, and, you know, I think scientists are, are asking questions, you know, why are kids not getting as sick? There are many theories that, you know, uh, scientists are having. No, I think I still don't know the answer. One may be, uh, like Dr. Molinato is, is saying, there are many com other common coronaviruses, and maybe there, the, um, if, if a, a child has, has had or been infected by one of those other coronaviruses, it may be of, um, offering some partial immunity. I think we're still learning about that. Or maybe uh, the immune system, uh, the, the blood cells that we use to fight off the, um, the viruses may be a little bit better primed to fight off um, kind of COVID-19 than adults. So I think there's still a lot that we're learning, but overall, um, Kids are not getting as sick, but that's that's really hard because it's affecting all of you. It's affecting um, you know what daily life has been over the last few months. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to briefly hi highlight. Um, so last week I was uh, so I'm a pediatrician in in, um, in the hospital, and last week I was taking care uh, in one of the hospitals three mothers, three pregnant mothers who actually had delivered who were, um, the mothers were positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the virus causing uh, um, COVID-19. And they had just delivered uh, babies, um, you know, uh, newborns. And so what's really interesting is that there's a, um, many new challenges that we're thinking about, about, you know, taking care of a newborn whose mother is positive for coronavirus. Um, you know, I think one thing is that there's a lot of, you know, uh, stress for the delivery, particularly for the, for the mother, um, but also, you know, having coronavirus, what does that mean in terms of the other support person, whether it's the father, another family member, or other hospital staff, so making sure that we have extra um, protection for everyone in terms of um, preventing the infection. Um, another thing that's been challenging is the visitor policy within hospitals. You can imagine that if a mother is positive or another family member is positive, then the hospital is, it doesn't want to have uh, coronavirus kind of spread within the hospital, right? So they kind of have to uh, um, minimize the number of people and have uh, only one visitor from family members. And that's causing a lot of um, concern and uh, questions with many of the, the mothers that um, have delivered. Um, and then what's interesting to talk about is, you know, what happens to the baby right after you're born, uh, the baby is born? Do they um, either isolate in the room with the, the mother, just kind of socially distance in the same hospital room? Or um, do you, for a short period of time, put the, the baby uh, in a separate room to potentially uh, decrease the risk of transmission. Um, and so I think families are thinking through some of those things. Um, another another an interesting challenge is, um, you know, if the father is positive for COVID-19, um, you know, and the found there's not a lot of family or support system, what do we tell the mother and, and how to take care of uh, the baby? Um, and then, you know, what there's some interesting discussions happening, you know, some uh, mothers, everyone else kind of worried about going to the hospital. And so on a big hospital system, um, what we've been seeing over the last few, at least during the uh, peak part of the shelter in pace was that not many individuals were go coming to the emergency room, coming to the hospital for any kind of uh, symptom or uh, concern. So, um, you know, that was having some implications about kind of what happens to kids and, and moving forward. But, you know, just to, to bring a few points of discussion about, um, you know, uh, we're starting to see uh, more cases um, more recently. And, and so this is going to be affecting not only families, mothers, but entire health system and all of you all. So I wanted to stop there and, and uh, would love to uh, take some questions. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, for uh, so s some people like naturally, or they not sometimes not naturally, but some people have like COVID nineteen like antibodies, so they can fight it off, and they're like completely immune to it, right? 
So uh, that's a good, so only if you have developed, if you actually have the virus or get the virus, does your body then develop the, the, immune, the antibodies to it. So there's two ways of getting antibodies, actually getting sick and getting um, you know, antibodies or uh, through a vaccine. And a vaccine is another way to um, help your body uh, uh, detect um, particular pathogens. For what's interesting, you know, for COVID-19, there are hundreds of companies and universities um, working day and night to try to find a vaccine for uh, COVID-19. And, and it's certainly been very challenging because I think um, researchers are trying to figure out what is the best way, what best part of the, um, you know, what's the best strategy to, to uh, ensure that everyone develops a robust immune response. Um, and, and get it licensed uh, such that uh, it's a safe, and, but really two ways of getting, you know, antibody to that. I have a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, if they're looking for a vaccine, uh, since a vaccine is basically just injecting a disease that is similar, but um, much less uh, dangerous into mm -hmm. the person, why can't they just inject um, SARS-CoV-1 if there's already a cure for that? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so there's there's uh, some subtle differences between even SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, and and there's actually not a lice, you know, many reasons why, but you know, the the um, SAR the SARS-CoV-1 um, there really didn't have as a broad of a um, effect on the entire healthier system, and so I think um, there still isn't a vaccine for that. Um, but maybe Dr. Baldwin Malinado has some additional um, uh, ideas about that too. Yeah, tell me again what the question is. The question is why can you not inject, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-1 uh, to uh, elicit an immune uh, response for, for SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, so they're very similar viruses. There's about 70% of the virus is the same but about 30% of the virus is not the same. And, and that 30% of the virus is, is part, part of that is where the immunity is. Remember I showed you the picture of the spike, the red spike triangle. And so that little spike area is where the antibodies need to go to prevent the virus from attaching to the, what we call the receptor, remember? So, um, so, the SARS virus does not attach to that area. So it's not the same. It doesn't block the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's a great idea. People were thinking about that, but it doesn't work. Can we transfer antibodies from like a person? Uh, if a person has antibodies of COVID, can we just transfer them to another person? Absolutely. There's something called convalescent plasma. Um, does anybody know what convalescent means? No. So convalescent means when you're recovering from something. So if somebody's gotten sick with COVID or SARS-CoV-2 and they were getting better, they've gotten better, they have convalesced, they've gotten better, they're, re they're recovering. And plasma is part of the liquid part of the blood that doesn't have cells in it. And you, they, people can take blood from the, the people who have been infected and they, um, they sort out the blood cells and they just take the plasma or the liquid part and they can inject that uh, by IV into people who are sick. And it sh in many cases, it looks like it might be able to block infection. So those are clinical studies that are being done right now. Those are called uh, clinical trials. That is, you don't know for sure that it works, uh, but it looks like it might work. And so those are studies people are doing right now. Um, I know. The WHO said that uh, dogs are immune to COVID-19. Scientists know why can't they just use that in humans? Well, um, so it turns out that actually a few dogs have gotten COVID-19, but probably that's very rare. Remember we said that co coronavirus exists 
There's lots and lots of coronaviruses, but there's only seven human coronaviruses. But other coronaviruses exist in dogs and cats and mice and other animals. Um, but they're different. They don't attach to our cells. They only attach to the cells of that animal. So if you gave a person a dog coronavirus, it probably wouldn't infect the person. And it that probably doesn't make immunity because you need to make immunity to that little spiky red thing that I showed you, the, the spike protein. Okay, question. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, uh, like, uh, I watched this video and then it was saying that they were like testing the virus on like eggs to, uh, because that's like the best place where they can like reproduce and do stuff, right? So then, uh, uh, and then like, couldn't they like uh, use that research, right? And then they said they made some experiment and it like worked, but then uh, where they would use like some, uh, it's this thing, I can't explain it. And then can't they, it's like, it, it, it has something to do with an egg, like, uh, and the egg like fights back or something like that. I don't know. So then can't they use uh, that eggs like cell or something and then put into the human's body? Well, probably what they're doing is they're growing the virus in eggs. Um, and then they're also testing those viruses with the antibodies to see if the antibodies can block the viruses from infecting the eggs. And so right now, the only ways that we could probably uh, prevent this disease is by using the convalescent plasma that we talked about. So the blood from people that have recovered that, and, and then the other way would be to use medications that we think could help block the, um, the virus from growing because there's a whole cycle. The virus has to uh, make, proteins from the RNA and then those proteins get packaged into viruses and then they come out of the cell and they infect other cells. So you can actually stop uh, the virus from doing that with certain types of drugs. And those are being tested right now. And then the third way would be to make a vaccine. And the vaccine is going to have to attach itself or, or make antibodies uh, to the area in that little red triangle area. The, the spike protein. So those are the three main ways that we can prevent this infection. Well, since it's over um, 4.30, we're gonna try to stop all questions now, but those are some amazing questions that everyone asked. Um, if you do have any more questions, you can always feel free to email me or Ryan or just text it in the chat and we can get back to them um, next week. But can everyone please thank um, Dr. Medi Rada and Dr. Maldonado for sharing their time with us today because I know everyone learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. We'll see you guys next week. It was great talking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.